atmosphere. So far, we've looked at the structure of the atmosphere and how it's evolved into its unique modern form that sustains life on Earth. In previous lessons, we saw how the atmosphere interacts with the energy that radiates from the sun and ensures that we're protected from harmful shortwave solar radiation. We looked specifically at ionizing activity in the ionosphere and the formation and destruction of ozone molecules in the stratosphere. We also learned that the chemical composition of the modern atmosphere helps to regulate the temperature on Earth, keeping it at a livable average of 15 degrees Celsius through greenhouse warming. It is very important for you to understand at this point that life itself is interwoven into the chemical processes and cycles in the atmosphere. These processes maintain the delicate balance that makes life possible in the first place. For example, photosynthesizing plants are as important today in removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and releasing oxygen into it as they were billions of years ago. Large forested areas like the Amazon forest in South America and the jungles of Uganda in Africa are often called the lungs of our planet. In addition, carbon dioxide is released back into the atmosphere by the respiration and decay of organic life forms and by the burning of fossil fuels. As you can imagine, the way in which human activities impact the environment will inevitably affect the natural balance between the atmosphere, lithosphere and hydrosphere. This is what we'll be looking at in today's lesson. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to explain the formation of the ozone hole, discuss the factors that influence global warming, and evaluate the effect of human activity on the atmosphere by analyzing data. As we begin to understand how our atmosphere protects us, we realize that we need to learn as much as possible about this amazing layer of gas. To this end, the Halley Bay Research Station was built in Antarctica. Here, regular measurements of the atmosphere are taken. Data is collected by ground-based instruments, airplanes, balloons and satellites. In the early 1980s, data from this research facility showed that the amount of ozone in the stratosphere had reached very low levels. The set of data was so bizarre that the computer did not register it at all. It was programmed to discard such low numbers. The scientists who were monitoring the data collection thought the equipment was faulty and had new equipment sent out. When the new equipment gave the same information, scientists were very shocked at the sudden loss in ozone. It became very urgent to find the cause of the ozone depletion. Let's analyze a graph that shows the amount of ozone present in the Antarctic stratosphere together. Each point on the graph represents the average total ozone per year for the month of October. What do you notice about the pattern of this graph? You should see that overall, although the levels fluctuated, the amount of ozone remained about the same from the first date on the graph, 1958, until 1975. You should also notice that after 1976, there is a sharp decline in the total ozone above the Antarctic, year on year. Clearly each year, more ozone is being depleted than restored. What could account for these two distinct patterns in the graph? Well, the changes in the first part of the graph are due to the annual temperature changes in the Antarctic atmosphere. In warmer years, there were lower ozone readings, and in colder years, there were higher ozone readings. But the average of these readings remained fairly constant. In the second part of the graph, there is a sharp decline in the total ozone above the Antarctic year on year. What happened to throw out the natural cycle? Can you think of the reasons for such high ozone depletion in the years after 1976? Well, round about this time, new technologies became widely used. People began making synthetic chemicals called halocarbons, including chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, and using them in a number of new products. They were used as refrigerants in fridges and air conditioners, blowing agents to expand plastics, propellants in aerosol cans such as deodorant and hairspray, Imagine having these products in your home for the first time. They made life so much easier that of course people were eager to use them. Research has shown that the sudden extensive use of halocarbons did not affect the troposphere. 
However, these gases made their way to the upper atmosphere. Here, strong UV radiation broke them apart, releasing carriers of highly reactive halogens such as fluorine, chlorine and bromine. To understand why this is a problem, we can think of it in terms of baking a cake. Certain ingredients are needed to make a specific cake. If you add some new ingredients, you cannot expect the same result. So, let's take a look at the chemistry that takes place in the Antarctic atmosphere and the effect of one new ingredient on this chemistry. In this example, we will look at the effect of chlorine only. The other halogens react in the same way. There is no light during the Antarctic winter. At this time, a strong circumpolar wind system, called the polar vortex, develops in the stratosphere. Temperatures can drop drastically because there is no incoming energy from the sun. When the temperature reaches below minus 80 degrees Celsius, special clouds form in the stratosphere of the polar regions. These polar stratospheric clouds, as they are called, are thought to be composed of nitric acid. Their formation happens all the time and is quite natural. But now enters the new ingredient. The halocarbons that have been filtered into the stratosphere are broken down by strong radiation. These breakdown products from the halocarbon form inorganic carriers or reservoirs of chlorine and move down into the polar vortex. These reservoirs for chlorine are hydrochloric acid and chlorine nitrate. The chlorine reservoirs react at the surface of the polar stratospheric clouds to form chlorine molecules that are highly reactive. These reactions are unusual and only happen on the surface of these clouds. They are also extremely fast. The two reservoirs of chlorine react together forming nitric acid and a chlorine molecule. The chlorine nitrate reservoir can also react with water. Nitric acid and perchloric acid form. The perchloric acid in turn reacts with hydrochloric acid to form water and more chlorine. This happens in complete darkness during winter from May to July. However, the real effects of this reaction can only be seen in August when the sunlight again reaches the Antarctic. Chlorine molecules can photodissociate easily. We have mentioned this term before when we looked at how oxygen formed in the Earth's second atmosphere. It means that they are split into their atoms by the sunlight. The problem is chlorine atoms act as a catalyst in a cycle that destroys ozone molecules. Remember, a catalyst is a chemical substance that speeds up a reaction without itself being used up during the reaction. In other words, one chlorine atom is able to speed up the destruction of many ozone molecules. With this new ingredient, the loss of ozone is very fast, so fast that the important balance between making and destroying ozone is no longer maintained. It has swung way out of control and scientists believe that this is a reason that there is almost no ozone left over Antarctica. This is tragic. Because of our advances in industrial technology, our atmosphere is suffering. But some countries are trying to make a difference. Some countries signed the Montreal Protocol in 1987. The original aim was to reduce the production of CFCs in 2000 by half. In the meantime, a new instrument called the TOMS instrument was designed and is used to gain a more accurate global picture of ozone levels. TOMS is short for Total Ozone Mapping Spectrometer. This instrument is mounted on a satellite and measures the thickness of the ozone layer in Dobson units, DU. The information we gathered from the TOMS is that the ozone layer is depleted in many places and not just over the Antarctic, although the depletion there is most severe. This information caused two revisions of the Montreal Protocol to be signed. European communities instituted stricter regulations to help solve this problem and the use of major halocarbons as propellant or refrigerator gases had been stopped by 1995. Although the extensive use of CFCs has been stopped, the CFCs that have already been released into the atmosphere can continue to do harm for up to 100 years. It is estimated that by 2030 the ozone layer will have healed, but some people predict that it will take longer. But hey, at least we're trying to solve the problem. Unfortunately, the use of CFCs is not the only human activity that impacts on the atmosphere. Global warming has been a buzzword for a while, but what is it exactly? 
Global warming is the observed increase in the average temperature of the Earth's atmosphere and oceans. But Earth has a history of changing average temperature. So why all the panic? Well, the meteorologists are concerned about how fast the average temperature is changing. They are attributing the small but sharp increase in temperature over the last 20 years to human activities and population growth. Carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases are released into the atmosphere as the product of burning fossil fuels such as coal and oil. Fossil fuels have become a major source of energy. In South Africa, as in many parts of the industrialized world, huge quantities of coal are used in the generation of electricity. Cars burn petrol, a derivative of oil, in their combustion engines. Carbon dioxide, water vapor and nitrous oxide are all emitted in the combustion process. Methane is produced by the decomposition of rubbish in landfills, mining activities and also in the guts of grazing animals like cows and nitrous oxide comes from human and animal waste. Normally we rely on natural vegetation that changes carbon dioxide into oxygen and carbohydrates during photosynthesis to remove CO2 from the atmosphere and keep a balance. But deforestation, or cutting down lots of trees to make space for homes and farming land, is reducing the mass of plant material on Earth. This means that carbon dioxide that would have reacted and been removed remains in the atmosphere. All this results in an increase in the volume of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Because carbon dioxide is such an efficient greenhouse gas, it makes sense why scientists are so concerned. Some scientists have linked an increased amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to the increase in temperature of the atmosphere. Not all scientists agree with this analysis. What's very interesting is that there's no direct link between the size of a population in an area and the amount of greenhouse gas emitted. Study the following table. See if the data in it support the statement. Do you notice that the USA, for example, contributes 18% to the total world greenhouse emission, but has only 4,6% of the world's population? Other countries have a higher percentage of the world population and yet do not emit as high a proportion of the world's greenhouse gas. China is an excellent example. About one-fifth of the world's people live here but are only responsible for about 10% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. So clearly, population size is not the only fact to be considered. What else contributes to the rapid increase of greenhouse gas emissions? You might want to discuss this with some of your friends. If you look at the degree of industrial and technological development of the countries that contribute most of the global greenhouse gas emissions, it's clear that this has a direct influence on the amount of greenhouse gas emitted. Countries that have very large populations but which are not highly industrialized may influence the greenhouse gas output drastically if they follow the same development path as the industrialized nations. Some of the predicted consequences of continued global warming are the rising of ocean levels and flooding of coastal areas, an increase in droughts and famine, and the extension of some plants and animal species. By signing the Kyoto Agreement, 141 countries pledged to take steps to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But the responsibility of reducing greenhouse gas emissions is not one that belongs to government and industry alone. We must all take action. So for your task today, I want you to think of ways in which you, as an ordinary citizen, can reduce the amount of greenhouse gases emitted in your own home. Write a letter to your local newspaper informing the general public about how to put your ideas into practice. It was great exploring the atmosphere with you. See you again soon for some more interesting science. Yeah.